All right, so we are preparing for a panel um, titled Religion on Mars, and I'm going to introduce the speakers and give a brief bio of each before we get started, uh, right before the lunch break. So um, first we have James Heiser. He is the Bishop of the Evangelical Lutheran Diocese of North America. He serves on the Board of Directors and Steering Committee of the Mars Society. He is pastor of the Salem Lutheran Church in Malone, Texas, and Dean of Missions for the Augustana Ministerium. Welcome, Dr. Heiser. Thank you. Next, we have Paul Levinson. Uh, ha he has published seven novels, 15 scholarly books, 50 stories, and written, written hundreds of songs. He is professor at Fordham University. That's me, by the way. We're not sitting in the right order. <laughs> And uh, Michael Walthmate is Senior Lecturer in Practical Theology at Rohr University Bochum in Germany. He has been researching the connections of space ex exploration, religion, and philosophy since 2011. His recent project deals with the ethics of sending Earth life to distant exoplanets. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank Dr. You. Levinson. How are you doing? Good. Well, I read with great interest uh, Bob Zubrin's interview that was uh, published, I think maybe last week, and I uh, immediately resonated with his point that if someone had asked him in 1969, where would we be in space in 2018? He thought uh, anyone who didn't say we'd be on Mars, out there in the solar system, far, far beyond where we in fact are today, anyone who said that in 1969 would have been crazy. And unfortunately, it turned out in the ensuing years and decades that we really didn't get very far at all after we got on the moon. And I'm an optimist by nature, so I can't remember exactly when I realized that we weren't getting anywhere beyond the moon. It was probably by the late 1980s. And so I began thinking, what went wrong? How come we didn't continue our efforts in space? And as you all know, the main reason that we got to the moon was because of military competition. When John F. Kennedy said, we're going to put a man on the moon by the end of the decade, the decade being the 60s, that was a, a direct challenge to what the Soviet Union had done in the 1950s and even the early 1960s. And I think as most historians and most people who've been paying attention recognize, the collapse of the Soviet Union, even before it collapsed formally as a country in the late 1980s, but the collapse of the Soviet Union as a major space-going power, and in fact its failure to put people on the moon, that might have been good for American chauvinism but it wasn't good for space because it basically knocked out that motive. So what motives were left? Well, there's the commercial motive and we see a lot of that today. Making money is good. Certainly independent sources of money that frees us from dependence on NASA, that's all good. But that hasn't gotten us very far either. And that's taking nothing away from SpaceX and all of those great developments. I'm all in favor of that. But here we are in 2018. They haven't gotten anyone to Mars yet either. In fact, they haven't even gotten anyone back walking around on the moon. There's the scientific motive. You know, that's the ever-present motive. You know, learn more in a scientific sense. That's always been one of the motives for getting off this planet. It always will be one of the motives. 
Unfortunately, it's the least sexy, exciting motive. It doesn't get people all that excited. It gets a few people excited, but in a, you know, a democracy like the United States, it doesn't get enough people excited to tell their congresspeople and senators, hey, you need to fund NASA at 10 times the level that it's now being funded. And it doesn't excite people the way, again, John F. Kennedy did, appealing to the military motive in the 1960s. So that's pretty bad news, because what motive is left? And as I mentioned, I'm an optimist, so I try to always look for solutions. And I realized at some point that an untapped motive might be actually the most profound and important motive of all. And that's in a sense that goes beyond specific science and data and numbers. Tells us a little bit more about who we are as sentient beings in this universe. What are we doing here? Where do we stand, as Blaise Pascal noted, this little speck standing up against the infinity of the cosmos? Science deals with that in its way, but there's another profoundly important human endeavor which deals with it in a very different way and actually complements science in many ways, even though this is often this mode is often seen as something that's contrary to science, but it's not at all intrinsically contrary to science. And this mode, for want of a better name, is religion, the religious impulse. And just to be crystal clear, I'm not talking about any particular religion in particular. Actually, that's just repeating myself. I'm not talking, though, about any specific religion. I'm talking about something that all religions share in one way or another. And when they operate at their best levels, when they're not persecuting scientists, as sometimes happens, when they're not at war with other religions, as sometimes even often happens, all of these abuses of religion. When those things are not dominating the religious environment, there is a clear call for let's find out more about who we are. When we look up at the night sky and we see the, that immensity of twinkling stars, all of that that's out there, I think most people know and religion speaks to the fact that we know very little, really, of what we are vis-a-vis -vis that, all that's out there. So I came to the conclusion that in order for our efforts to get off this planet in a permanent, continuing, expanding way, we need to have an alliance with this religious impulse. A few years ago, I was at a very small little conference in Brooklyn with Michael Waltemoth, and we were both talking about the future. And we were both talking a little bit about space exploration. And after the panel, we realized that we both had the same feeling about the connection of space travel and religion. So we decided to put together a book. It's called Touching the Face of the Cosmos on the Intersection of Space Travel and Religion. It consists of an interview I did with John Glenn about a year before he died. It consists of otherwise about half of the book are essays exploring some of these issues. And the other half is science fiction, because science fiction is a very good medium for exploring the melding of religion and space travel. 
And by the way, you can get that book on Amazon also as a Kindle. It's a little bit more than three dollars. Don't worry, it's not that expensive. It's like, I think, $9.99 for the Kindle. There's also a paperback edition. If you want to go completely crazy, there's even a hardcover edition. So uh, if you're interested, you can read more about that. But out of that book, something else has emerged and is, has begun to emerge. James Heiser has an essay in that book. Two years ago, we had a panel on this very topic at the Mars Society conference in Washington. And we are now beginning to put together plans for a series of books on this topic, as well as a society specifically to explore and encourage the joining of religion with the space effort. We had a little conference at Fordham University a few months ago. We had Guy Consolmagno, the Pope's astronomer. He's a great advocate of this as well. And just to be clear where I and we stand, and uh, then uh, I'll let our other two speakers talk to you. Um, I think we think that anything that can help get us off this planet is worth pursuing. So let me conclude by something which has nothing to do with religion, but really displays in huge headlines what I mean about welcoming anything that gets us off this planet. Anyone who knows my political views, knows my work, knows that I disagree with just about everything that our current president has done and is doing. In fact, one of my best known books is Fake News in Real Context. And one of the main points of that book is how the president has used fake news as a label for anything he doesn't like. That's a very dangerous thing. It's something that's reminiscent of the Lugan Press label that Hitler gave to the press. So I am no friend, let alone a champion, of Donald Trump. But you know what? I welcome his talk about a space force. I'm not concerned that it's militarizing space. Captain Kirk was part of a military force. So was Captain Picard. And the military can be used for good. And if this helps focus and increase our efforts in space, I'm all for it. Thank you. So um, we, we decided, can you hear me? Good, we decided to speak from here as... Uh, I can do that. I can do that better. Oh, boy. Um, okay. Um, we decided to speak from here now. Um, just in reaction to that, um, almost everything's been said now. The book's been pitched. We might as well just leave it at that. Um, <laughs> I just have a couple of observations. Um, and uh, when, when, when Paul was talking about religion and space exploration, um, he, he pitched religion as a possible motive for space exploration. And while I do agree with that, um, there, there's other ways of looking at religion and space exploration. You can, um, and I just ordered them here. Um, I think the order's wrong, but anyway. You can, you can look at religion as part of the human condition, and you could argue if we go out into space, we won't get rid of it, right? Although you would like to, we probably won't get rid of it. And um, that, that opens up some, some interesting questions about what religion will be in outer space. As you said, um, we are looking up to the heavens, trying to figure out who we are, what we are, where we are, what happens when we look down from the heavens and try to think about where did we come from. And just as one, one simple, probably very simple point, all the major world religions are based here on Earth. Christianity has spots on earth that it relates to Judaism has spots on earth that it relates to Islam has spots on earth places that it relates to those will all be gone if we go 
out there and leave Earth. So that will be a transformative experience for religion. And I'm very curious as a theologian um, what that will do to religions. Um, I don't think it will go away. It's part of the human condition, which leads me to some, some other aspect of religion. Religion has also always been grounds for opposition to space exploration. Um, you mentioned 1969, the, uh, the Apollo launches. During the, the Apollo 11 launch, there was a group of uh, religious protesters invited by Thomas Paine to sit on the, in the VIP section and watch the launch because they had come to the Kennedy Space Center with two, two mule carts, by the way, mule-drawn carts to, to show their opposition to, to this technical endeavor. And their argument was, there's poor people on Earth. We should spend that money on the poor people. And I think the, the, the reaction of, of uh, then NASA Administrator Thomas Paine was, was very, very good. He invited them in, um, stating that if he or if NASA could not, would not push the button the next day, meaning not launch Apollo 11, and that would help poor people, he would do that. But as there was, in his view, no relation between stopping Apollo 11 and helping poor people, they might as well enjoy that, become part of the process. And in the end, the, the Reverend Abernathy, who was uh, responsible for that group, and uh, that's quoted by, by Norman Mailer in the book of Fire on the Moon, but you can also find it uh, quoted in, in the New York Times. Um, he said, this has just become holy ground because humanity has left Earth at this spot. So it turned from religious opposition to religious reframing of space exploration, which is an interesting way of trying to include opposition into the, the space exploration um, movement. And just one last thing, and you've also alluded to that, I think it's very vital, and I'll, I'll just push something I'm doing. I'm working on a project with a colleague. Um, I'm working in religious education. That means I'm, I'm te doing teacher training for, for religion teachers in Germany, and we are working on a project to introduce science into the curriculum, because we have found that within the humanities, there are a lot of students who know just a little about technology, but they do have strong moral or ethical objections to technology. And I think it is absolutely vital to, to, to enhance the scope of religion in that regard, to embrace science and technological knowledge, to be better able to evaluate that. And um, that leads to what you just called fake news or the, the idea that human feelings are more important than facts if we, if we just go if we don't balance that out, if we just go to one end of the spectrum, we will be in trouble. And in that way, I would totally agree with Paul that religion and space exploration should be connected that way, in a balanced way that includes science, technology, and the more human needs that are often not as um, analytical and logical as, as the other part. And with that, I would hand the microphone over to James. Thank you. As many of you know, I've known quite a few of you for, well, two decades now. Um, the occasion of this anniversary of the Mars Society has been kind of a point for me to reflect on in that when I came and spoke at the first convention in 98, uh, uh, was about two weeks before going um, to the parish that I'm currently serving at in Texas. So I've been there for 20 years. One of the reasons why I won't be staying for the banquet, I was telling uh, Michael, is that I've got to get home for the anniversary celebration back there. But for me, as many of you know, this is a matter of a pastoral concern with questions pertaining to why. Um, the moment you ask why questions with regard to Mars or anything which we do off this planet, you're the why questions are the ones that intrigue me. How, we've gotten very good at how questions. That we're very good at engineering. And whether or not something is technically possible and what the best and most feasible way to do it. But the reasons why people seek to do this immediately move you into the realm of philosophy and theology because you get at the motivations for what stirs the human heart and mind to seek a particular path. 
and you learn a lot about a way that a person understands themselves and their relationship to the entire rest of the human race by the way that they then explain their motivations. Why do you care? And it's not a matter so much of my trying to say, well, this method is valid or that one is not. I'm concerned more with those who, on the basis of why, find the human race unworthy of such an undertaking. I had the opportunity to come across a quote uh, from an academic publication uh, in an article which was at least honestly entitled, entitled, Should Humans Colonize Other Planets? No. And the author of this essay reaches a fundamentally theological conclusion. Um, for she declares, the current state of human society gives no indication that we are any better equipped today than they were 500 years ago to accomplish such goals. In its current state of moral development, the author finds humankind unfit to engage in the colonization of other planets and the exploitation of outer space resources." End quote. Now, I find this an astounding assertion because Basically, she's kind of backed her way into the doctrine of original sin, and as a pastor with decades of parish experience, hearing confessions, etc., if you're going to wait for the human race to be morally worthy of anything, <laughs> we won't do anything. At least. <laughs> Just, just imagine if he, she could flood the valley. That would be really terrible. <laughs> <laughs> so what is needed is always to be then evaluating the decisions that we're making, the motivations for our actions, and being guided by sound ethical principles, which can be enunciated and evaluated in terms of guiding our path forward. Um, Sometimes those are things which are stated in very clearly theological terms. Other times they are perceived to be um, under the looser topic of ethics. But why we do something matters. And it, it often is the reason why we will evaluate the how. Um, you can accomplish something by an immoral end, and that is something which destroys the value of the entire action. But in terms of going back to this, this person who has found humanity unworthy. This is why there's always room for repentance and restoration. And I think that often when we look at the tensions and rivalries of the past in this whole grand mess of science and religion, that there's a need for both sides to, um, in keeping with repentance and restoration, to turn away from the things which have been obstacles in the past and to move forward together uh, with respect for our areas of understanding and what we bring to the table. I, again, in this sense of, in just one last personal landing note, I guess, thinking about this anniversary, because Michael made reference to the fact, of, and, and Paul did too, of, of these occasions of persecution. Um, for me, the humorous anecdote is thinking all the way back to the first convention, giving my paper, um, excited young man, who I get to talk at a conference, and talking with a couple of folks afterwards and having a fellow come up to me and shake his finger in my face and say, the entire reason we need to go to Mars is to get away from people like you. <laughs> and I'm, I'm a kid, right? And so I have this reaction of, boy, I'm, I'm really sorry that you feel that way, but, um, you know, we're all influenced by our own personal experiences. And it's how we choose to weigh that in terms of how we relate with others in the future that matters uh, in terms of course, charting the course for the future in this. As both of these gentlemen have set forth, this is part of the ongoing effort with these volumes which we hope will continue to be published is to encourage that kind of a dialogue in a public space where we expect um, respect for all those who are part of that discussion. And um, I hope that there are many among you that will join us in that conversation. Thanks. I think we've got time for just a couple of questions. A couple of questions. Um, given we're finding exoplanets and studying 
for intelligent life, looking for intelligent life, what do you think the average world citizen of Earth will think the three things maybe might come up? You can do a lightning round for all three of you uh, that might come up in the average mind of, a, of an Earthling once that happens, once it's obvious that it's there. Well, I'm sure there'll be some people who will be frightened by that. But, you know, I'm a Cartesian fundamentally. You know, I think, therefore I am. And so I tend to think that what I think, most human beings also think. And so I can tell you what I would feel. I would be thrilled to the core. Because, and, you know, we didn't really talk much about Mars per se. The whole point of finding out more about who we are and what we're doing is to see ourselves in a different way from a different perspective. So on Mars, we would be doing that. But if and when the day comes where we come in contact with some kind of extraterrestrial intelligence that is at least enough like our intelligence that we can communicate with them. Otherwise, it would just be like Kant's the thing in itself. In other words, if it's such a recondite intelligence that we can't even recognize it, then it's almost meaningless. But if, if we can recognize it, I think that would be a profoundly important and great day in human existence. Um, if you had asked the question, will it, will it change religion? Um, there's been a study done by a friend of ours, Ted Peters, um, and he asked religious people if that was a problem for their religion. Now, as a theologian, I would say when you look at the dogmatics of religion, it is a problem. But when you look at individual faith, that is individual faith, and it won't be destroyed by that. So um, from a religion point of view, that will be, as you said, it will be a fascinating day to think about that. Yeah? I would just look at it from the perspective of saying that my favorite Lutheran um, astronomer, uh, Johannes Kepler, was finally proven right after four centuries that um, he had made the point, writing in a theological vein, that we would expect, given the divine creation of the universe, that every world would have life that fit for that world. And I'm always intrigued when it's brought up as if, um, I'm not saying the question was, but just this question is often brought up in the context of, will finding life in other worlds overthrow your faith? Like, well, no, actually, we've been anticipating this for hundreds of years, so I think we'll be okay. And it, if I think it would do us well to study those earlier assessments, which were done long before this began to be seen as a practical possibility, and say, you know, I mean, Kepler was by no means alone in that kind of an assessment, but the expectation of, of course, it will be a, a life-rich universe. Is it? Well, we still don't have the answer to that question. But if, we, if it is, then it's not as if that was a question that was unanticipated and somehow was overthrown the foundations of everything that we know and believe. So. Hi. Uh, so with the current uh, political environment basically an assault on, on religion, I think it would be really helpful somewhere if somebody comes in and defines what religion is because generally... When people say the word religion, they're thinking organized religion. But whatever the agnostics are believing that we're just uh, bioelectromechanical um, organisms um, is also technically a religion. I mean, a religion is a belief system. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know if you've done that in the books that you've done, but if not, I think it would be a really great place to expand to. Yeah, I th that's a great question. I think it was David Hume who talked about the various responses that uh, uh, human minds can have to like really profound problems, uh, r ranging from saying, hey, this is just too much, I'm gonna go back and drink my tea and not think about it again, to uh, buying in to some kind of uh, accepted answer that other people subscribe to, to three, leaving the wound open. Uh, because that maximizes the amount of information that we might take in. And, and that's actually my definition of religion, w not the second, not, not agreeing with, uh, I happen to be Jewish, not agreeing with what Judaism teaches per se, not agreeing with what the Roman Catholic Church teaches, I'm a professor at Fordham University, not agreeing with what any organized religion, I might agree with some of it, 
a lot of it, but not all of it. And I think the most important thing that characterizes what religion is, is, is keeping that wound open, recognizing that we have a, a, a tiny bit of knowledge uh, to answer these profoundly, almost seemingly impossible questions to answer. I would say just by way of dealing with definitions of religion, you're always, in, in the broadest possible sense, dealing with the, those things which a person accepts axiomatically and then their extrapolations or beliefs that extend from there. In that everyone is religious, um, no one more so than the atheist, in that you, you operate from certain axiomatic principles which are incapable of a certain level of invalidation um, that you take as true and then your worldview is shaped outward from there. And I think very often we end up arguing or discussing data points which take on an entirely different um, assessment based on your axioms that you bring to the equation. So religion in that sense is uh, caught up with the particular um, axiomatic points which a human being accepts as true before they even uh, begin to uh, uh, continue their analysis of, um, of data. The, the difficulty is admitting that you have such axioms and people often are blind to their own axiomatic points because then people become angry and start shaking their fist and saying, well, that's, you know, that's what you religious people do. No, 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 you do that too, we all do. I'm sorry, there was another question. Yes, thank you. Let's move into the practical future. And you are on Mars, a parent, a family. How do you express your faith to a child who is no longer in the image of God? Because he is a Martian with whatever physical changes have been brought to him there. Well, the. The image of God, as traditionally interpreted in theology, is not a reference to physicality. It's a matter of um, the spiritual um, essence of the, of the person, um, primarily in terms of the original righteousness that was imparted to um, our first parents, but um, which continues on in all human beings. I mean, all human beings are made in the image of God but that's something which has now been corrupted by our transgression. So if you find a human being, um, that sense of the Imago Dei is, is still present in some fashion. So it doesn't matter where that person happens to be. Um, they're still a human being. And I mean, that's, that's in essence what you're, you're dealing with is the larger question of, are we talking about humans? Yes, we are. And so therefore, I don't care if they're Martians or Earthers or Belters. Yeah, but, but I would add, even this relates to the previous question, I would say any sentient being, and you know, I, you know, I have a dog, I love dogs, but I don't think dogs are sentient, sorry. They, they don't publish books, they don't make music, whatever. They're wonderful, very lovable, but not sentient. So any sentient being, even an alien being, which in terms of DNA has nothing in common with humanity, I would say, uh, you know, my definition of God is that that sentient being is also in God's image. So um, I'm, I, can, I can only, <laughs> or let me play with that a bit. Um, Guy Consolmagno was just mentioned as the Pope's astronomer, right? The, the director of the Vatican Observatory um, was asked that question, and his answer was, and it's a very clever answer because it doesn't answer anything. Um, <laughs> he is a Jesuit. <laughs> basically, he says every being no matter how many tentacles it has, is welcome in my church as long as it has a soul. And it doesn't answer anything because it does not clear that, that little soul problem. But uh, I would, as, uh, you, you've, you've, you've tried to boil it down to physicality, and I would agree with James that that, that doesn't cut it. Um, on the other hand, if we boil it down to traits like self-awareness, what about dolphins or dogs, right? So, so it doesn't, then Christianity has a, has a tradition that, that excludes those. I don't know how we, how we solve that problem. It's a fascinating problem. I think the child on Mars born by human parents is not a problem. The more interesting problem is extending that to other sentient beings. Maybe we okay. should talk about that, not in the practical future, but after 10,000s of generations on Mars, how that would work in 
Ben. I, I think I have a practical solution to that in that um, my cat does not object to my asserting the fact that it is not made in the image and likeness of God. Um, that perhaps one of the things that we look for in terms of sentience is whether or not they can be offended by the question of whether or not they're included in the definition. Um, <laughs> That's good. I, 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 I will ask the next dolphin I there's, see. There's a famous science fiction story. I can't remember the author. I mean, maybe Ray Bradbury, but I'm not sure, about uh, you know a, a human astronaut who lands on a planet, and the astronaut is just dying. The equipment is breaking down. It's, like, incredibly hot. It, it, it's pretty clear to him that he's not going to make it. And then one morning he wakes up and he starts feeling a little better. And as time goes on, he starts feeling a lot better. And by the end of the story, he's in great shape. He's still human, but he looks nothing like a human. The, the environment on that planet changed him into a physical organism that could be comfortable on that planet. I think we need to probably wrap it up there. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. For, 